Hey there, welcome to Culture by Culture, a multidimensional exploration of Black and Asian pop cultural ties. I'm your language learning host, Delia, and today I'm joined by neurolinguist Dr. Sarah Phillips. Hi, Sarah. Hello, how are you? I'm very good. I'm very excited to have you on. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. Tell the folks a little bit about yourself. I know you're a neurolinguist. Maybe you can say what, what is neurolinguistics for the folks at home? Sure. Yeah. So I am a neurolinguist, which is in essence, someone who is interested in studying how our brains support language functions. So what parts of the brain are responsible for doing things like comprehending language, producing language, um, and how the brain as a system really works to support that, especially when you're doing things normally and in and healthy scenarios. But I also do research that has clinical implications. So for people who suffer from things like aphasia or some kind of processing deficit, people who also suffer from specific language impairments or maybe even dyslexia, there are a lot of avenues that my research can tie into and in, in people's quality of life day to day. But my primary focus is to understand the typical healthy brain and how the typical healthy brain supports language. That is so fascinating. Uh, Just so my listeners know, basically how this came to be was Sarah followed culture by culture. And I love languages. I love the idea of the study of language. I'm not not a linguist, to be clear, but I just have always found them very fascinating. And so I saw that she was a neurolinguist, I immediately went into her DMs. I feel like I probably jump scared her because it was immediate. Like as soon as the notification came through, I was like, oh my gosh. It was pretty quick. I'm not going to lie. And it, <laughs> and it's funny too, because I was like, you know, we've all done the thing where it's like late in the evening, we're starting to wind down. And even though all the best advice tells you like, don't be on your phone right before you go to bed. I was definitely on my phone <laughs> while getting ready to go to bed. And I'm scrolling and I'm scrolling. And I think you had a post um, about Black and Asian relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think this was, was, I think it was Malcolm X. Yes, and Yuri. And I was just like, oh, this is so cool. Like, I know that this is a thing, but I didn't know the depths of it. Mm-hmm. And it was so well explained. And so I just, I liked it. And I was like, this is cool. Um, I like this kind of content. Let me follow this person. And then, yeah, pretty quick after that, I got a DM and I was like, whoa, that was <laughs> That was fast. I do usually try to be more chill, but I was so excited because also you, uh, how would you say you identify? Oh, I'm Blasian. Mm-hmm. Cool. She's also Blasian. And so I was like, I had to make it happen. I had to. You can't let the moment slip by because <laughs> what if they unfollow? You never know. You got to be quick. So, okay. You explain what neurolinguistics are. So originally I had this episode idea and I talked to Sarah about this originally I was curious if there was any data on like language learning trends in the Black community. Unsurprisingly, not really, which is why I couldn't find any. I've done a lot of research just trying to find it because I I had noticed at various HBCUs we're seeing more uh, like Korean language offerings and just kind of a diversification of the language offerings available at some HBCUs. I know not all. I know I have listeners who probably go to various HBCUs and are like, not at mine. But that's a trend that I've noticed. I wondered if there was data to speak to that and unsurprisingly, no. But what Sarah told me, which was really good perspective, what is the issue, if there is any issue, with framing it as, is Black language learning trending in a certain direction? Yeah. So I think we have to take a step back and really think about why is it that we don't see a lot of Black people, particularly in the United States, learning another language. And I think it comes from you know, at least anecdotally from a place of generational trauma. We come from, you know, enslaved Africans. We are the descendants of enslaved Africans where we've had our language stripped away, taken from us and been forced to learn. I really shouldn't say forced, but we didn't really have much of an option in terms of using one of the languages that was prevalent through slavery. Because if you think about it, You have people coming from all different tribal communities, speaking all different languages, all being forced um, onto a boat chained together, brought to the United States. You're getting bought to the highest bidder. So you don't know that people are being bought necessarily by tribal community. They're just being bought based off the needs of, Mm -hmm. you know, the industry at that time. And so people are not getting selected so that way they can stay a community. And when you have a bunch of people who don't necessarily speak the same language together, but you need to survive for the sake of your own humanity, you're going to then become linguistically very creative. And that's what we've started to unpack um, in terms of historically what has happened with African-American English or African-American language. 
then now you, you situate us in a time period where our language is cool, but it's not considered proper English. Mm-hmm. And that's because it's not mainstream or standardized, let's call it waspy American <laughs> English, right? So right. wasp meaning white Anglo-Saxon Protestant E American English. And so when you have a group of people who've had their mother languages stripped away. Now we have developed a linguistic system that works for us, that is identified and deeply connected to our culture and has diversified over time as we've, you know, migrated to different parts of the U.S. and developed our own little pockets and communities. Now you're telling us like our language is cool enough for a rap song, but it's not cool enough for, you know, people to treat it as it is as its own legitimate language that's already taxing on the individual. It's already taxing on Black bodies. And then the idea of then learning another language when you still have anti-Blackness in all parts of the world. Mm-hmm. So for example, this, this idea about Asian languages and people learning Asian languages, in particular Black people learning Asian languages, you have to remember that a lot of Asian communities operate in this very homogeneous kind of community or communities. And so they're used to people who look a specific type of way speaking the kind of language that they speak. And now, you know, you have, of course, some people who are very welcoming and embracing, but not all Asian people are going to be welcoming and embracing because they're going to have their own internal biases against Blackness um, that, mm-hmm. that also is prevalent in Asian cultures. So now you've got a Black body who unfortunately does not have the same linguistic connections to their ancestry. They've developed a linguistic system that's been taught to them as being insufficient or lacking in some way. And then you try to learn another language that's already going to treat you differently because of the way that you look. It puts you in a lose-lose-lose situation and it can be very discouraging, especially when we think about the kinds of social burdens that code switching can have on individuals who have to manage this constantly. So I think for that reason, we don't see a lot of it. Um, And I think it's mostly because at least anecdotally, just from what I've observed, and even in my own experiences, as someone who grew up bilingual, Mm -hmm. that it's not always advantageous, and it can be an uphill battle. That's essentially what you said in the DMs when I asked you about it. And I was that much more interested because it's so true that there are barriers in the way to Black people especially in America, learning other languages. And this podcast is about the points of connections between Black and Asian cultures through the lens of pop culture mostly. However, I think it's just as important and just as interesting to look at those barriers of connection because they're not barriers we're seeking out, right? We're not rejecting Asian languages. I think in general, I've seen data that says there has been, at least I've seen data regarding Korean language learning, like across the board, you will. I don't know if languages can be on trend, but that's the... (laughs) The takeaway. Oh, Korean is Korean is definitely on trend, and it's been on trend for a while. Like mm. Korean dramas, Korean pop music since shoot when I was in middle school was becoming on trend, and it's just grown exponentially as we are entering what is now what third, fourth, fifth generation K-pop groups. Mm-hmm. I don't even know what generation we're in now. I don't even know I all the lingo. We might be going into fifth. I know fourth is like getting kind of older, so we might be going into fifth. Unclear to me. <laughs> I mean, I was around for like first generation K-pop, like not to date myself, but I am that person. And and it's funny too, because like as a Black and Korean American, one of the things that was, I think, unusual in my upbringing is that my mom would not allow me to think of myself as not being Korean. Like I went to Hangarakyo, so I had to go to Korean language school. Mm. I learned how to read and write. We would go and visit my mom's side of the family almost every summer, if not every other summer, growing up through my childhood. So going to Korea and speaking Korean became necessary because my mom's side of the family, like my grandmother didn't speak English. My Mm -hmm. great aunts and their children, like nobody else spoke English except for maybe a few words here or there and like, hello and thank you. And so for me, it became very important to learn Korean, even though I would go into spaces and be ostracized or felt to be different um, despite my mom's efforts in trying to ensure that, yes, you are Korean. Like you're going to learn how to make kimchi and you're going to learn how to speak Korean and you're going to learn how to read and write and do all the things that a Korean woman would learn how to do. Like your life motto is Iseng and Gosengida. Like life is suffering. And that's a very Korean 
Ajma thing to say, Mm -hmm. but, you know, she wanted me to grow up knowing where I come from and being able to connect with my family. And for that reason, I had to learn how to speak Korean, but there were plenty of instances where I'm outside of my family and I'm using Korean and people just look at me not knowing what to do and being very confused, Um, sometimes even being aggressive or very negative. And unfortunately, it has taken me years to learn contextually why they might feel that way. Because American GIs in Korea, you know, in case you haven't read the latest New York Times article that recently came out, there was actually a lot of misconduct happening between American GIs and Korean civilians, Mm -hmm. in particular Korean women. And so while my mom was one of the few who did actually marry a Black American GI, and they were married until my dad passed away. Mm -hmm. So they were married for over, you know, 30 years. That wasn't common. That wasn't the norm. And unfortunately, there was this very negative reputation of American GIs, not just Black, but but also Mm -hmm. Black GIs in Korea, such that people didn't know what to do with me and had very negative feelings even when you have people like Insumi and Yunmire, these are mm-hmm. Black and Korean women in South Korea who are entertainers and very popular, even with those people existing and being you know, readily accessible in that space, people didn't see people like me as potentially being like that or, you know, having something to offer Korean people in the Korean community outside of the Korean diaspora. Mm -hmm. So it's a strange space to be in when you're a Black person who doesn't have the cultural ties and then also then wants to learn how to speak Korean because it is popular and Korean pop music is very catchy and Mm -hmm. the dramas are very exciting and they offer something different uh, compared to what American TV shows offer. So I totally get why it's popular. And, you know, if you can learn the language to then better understand the music and the dramas and all that kind of stuff, it's inevitable. For sure. You know, this podcast isn't a critique on the military industrial complex, but if it were... That's a big critique of the military industrial complex. Yeah, I have read that article. It is very common, unfortunately. And so I do see how it's an uphill battle for Black folks learning Korean. I will, full disclosure, I'm learning Korean. I'm not good at it. Don't don't look at me. <laughs> don't perceive me. However, even I feel trepidation entering spaces. I haven't come across anything really negative personally. Thankfully, the school I've gone through been very positive. The people I've met have been really welcoming and really warm, but I know that's not always the case. And there's always trepidation when like certain topics come up. Cause you know, when you're learning or ideally I would say if you're learning Korean language, hopefully you're also learning about Korean culture not just, you know, grammar or learning to speak it. I find that learning languages in general, it's very important to also learn the culture because language and culture go hand in hand, both inform the other, but cultural topics will come up. And I'm always just like, I tense up. Cause I'm like, is it, is it the time? Is it, is it now that it's going to happen that, <laughs> and again, luckily for me, no, but there is opportunity opportunity for that to happen. And I can see that in and of itself, just having to deal with that on top of everything we deal with as Black people in America specifically, just it's too much of a hurdle to overcome when you can learn something like, I don't know, Spanish. It's easily accessible. A lot of people speak it. Not that with every language there is, if you don't know, racism is worldwide. But, you know, there's some languages I think you can learn with less, for lack of a better term, baggage, I suppose. Like you're you're more welcomed into the space or maybe less unchecked baggage, I think. I think the interaction between Korean and Black people is still very, not really looked at. Like, it's a thing that I think we don't speak about a lot. And I think some of that goes back into Korean culture and how they process trauma historically, but also Black people just saying, okay, if y'all don't want me here, I'm not going to be here. So it doesn't get talked about much, I think. Yeah, there's definitely trauma on both ends. Mm -hmm. And I think the younger the generation, the less of that trauma rears its ugly head. I think people are starting to be in a space now wanting to break some of these generational traumas, which is really encouraging. But I'm not going to lie, like, don't expect, you know, someone who's ajima or older, you know, a Mm -hmm. middle-aged woman and older to be the most most welcoming person. I mean, unless you're meeting my mother because she was married to a black man for over 30 years. Like she has a very different perspective on black people Mm -hmm. than say, like if you were to go to LA and interact with, let's say some Korean people in certain parts of LA where, you know, they went through the riots. Mm -hmm. Um, If Mm -hmm. they went through 
any of those riots during the 90s, like they might still be suffering from that direct trauma because tension between Black and Korean Americans during that time period was very high. And so I like what you said, though, about language and culture. Like if you're going to learn a language, learn the culture, which means learning a little bit, not just about eating customs or, you know, what to do when you're moving in and out spaces, but also learn a little bit about the history of the people, Mm -hmm. because that's when you'll start to maybe understand why there may be tension. It doesn't condone when people make xenophobic or racist, you know, actions or statements, but at least it puts you in a place of power because then you can understand why they might be reacting the way that they're reacting. And then you can respond in a way that de-escalates rather than escalates the situation. Mm -hmm. Oh, I totally agree. And I think it's similar. We as Black people in America, you know, when talking about African-American language, all we're doing is asking folks to understand, like, this is a legitimate language. We have legitimate grammar structures. Not that you need that to be legitimate, but we do. It does. It has legitimate grammar structures. It's There's a history to it. There's a reason why it sounds the way it does. There's a reason it spread the way it did. All components of a language like any other. And if you learn that, I find that your understanding of Black American history and culture is so much richer. And I feel like if people understood it, they could engage with us in a more deep way. And so I think if we're asking folks to do that, it helps if you're going into these language spaces, not just Korean, but any language, whatever language you're learning at home, I think this is key to do because even if there isn't as overt trauma between the two races as there is with Korean and Black folk, there is always something because white supremacy has been exported internationally. (laughs) Yeah, it's everywhere. Unfortunately. I wanted to go back a little bit. You're talking about growing up as a bilingual Black person. I find it super interesting because I've had Blasian friends in the past, and I don't know that they have that shared experience. Again, I won't speak for them, but I've not heard them have their Asian parent be so adamant, like, no, you are this. You're going to learn the language. You are just like any other. And I'm just curious about what that experience was like, if you could expound a bit on it, and if you know why your mom was so rooted in that. That's a really good question. I have no idea why my mom was so focused on me knowing that I'm Korean because, you know, every parent does that little thing where when two parents fight, they're like, that's your daughter. No, that's Mm -hmm. your daughter. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. So like there were times where my parents would fight because I would have done something, whatever the case may be. And at one point my mom's like, no, that's your daughter. And my dad would go, no, that's your daughter, you know? Mm -hmm. So all those, you know, instances aside, I think the biggest thing is that, you know, my mom married my father 30 something years ago. And when she moved to the United States to be with my dad, she had no one else, but my dad and my dad's side of the family. Mm -hmm. And as much as my dad and dad's side of the family really tried to understand where she was coming from and even learn to eat some of the things that she liked to eat and learn some of the things. I mean, they never really learned Korean. Like Mm -hmm. my dad maybe knew all of three phrases and that was hello thank you and basically where's the bathroom mm. oh and he can order beer so it's like <laughs> you say oh so did you say it like please <laughs> like soju please beer please you know like phrases very course. essentially the key phrases <laughs> how you can operate to like eat and drink and have a good time among korean people basically mm-hmm. But other than that, you know, the rest of my dad's family didn't really learn Korean either, even though they were in direct contact with her. It was my mom who really took up that burden to learn English. Mm -hmm. And I think whether that was stressful for her or it could be also this kind of like identity crisis that one goes through when you feel like you don't have someone to talk with in your own language and use your own words and like the way that you feel most comfortable expressing yourself I think there could be this complex mix of some of those things that fed into why my mom was very adamant with me learning Korean. The other part of it is, of course, knowing her family does not speak English. And Mm -hmm. she wanted to be able to go and spend time with her family as the balancing act for giving up her Korean citizenship and becoming an American citizen to be with my father. It's like, well, if I'm going to come to the U.S., Like we need to be able to go see my family regularly. Mm -hmm. That was not a hard sell on my dad. My dad loved Korea. And so again, can totally understand why black people today, just people in general today love Korean everything Mm -hmm. and want to go visit. You know, I totally get it. But I think for her, it was the combination of just her own complex issues with sacrificing so much to be with my dad, Mm -hmm. but then also wanting to feel 
connected to her family in some way such that because I am her family, like this is also something that I'm taxed with. Now, that didn't necessarily translate to my younger sister. She's 10 years younger than me. My little sister does understand some Korean. She doesn't speak very much of it. And before you ask me, we actually don't understand why that this happens, why people become receptive bilinguals, but not necessarily productive bilinguals in the Mm -hmm. sense of being able to produce as much as they can understand it. But I will say that I think I was held to a different set of standards when it came to understanding and speaking Korean compared to my sister. Mm -hmm. Um, And that comes from, I think, a Korean cultural standpoint of what it means to be the first daughter. Mm -hmm. When you are the oldest daughter, there is a cultural thing that happens with being the first daughter. And a lot of responsibility that comes with the family gets placed on the oldest daughter. And that's something that my mom did because that's what happened with her and with my, you know, it just gets passed down generation by generation. So yeah, I think that that was a big part of it. Also, I think, (laughs) I think I was very much open to it because it's different. I grew up in, for the most part in North Carolina, we did move around a little bit and I spent a lot of my time around my black side of my family. So my dad's side of the family. And so when you grow up in that kind of environment and you're always around your black side of the family, you know, my mom wanted to also, you know, be like, basically buck back. My mom wanted to buck back and be like, oh, you think you that you, you think you this, mm-hmm. but Korean people, we do this and Korean people, we do like Korean pride is such a, <laughs> such a underestimated thing. Like Korean people are so incredibly prideful. Mm-hmm. I think Asian people in general are very prideful and we show it in different ways, especially in how we compete against each other. Mm-hmm. But my mom, I think also had a bit of that pride too. And was like, oh, you think you're this and you're that. Well, this is what Korean people can do. And this is what Korean people have to offer. And my daughter's Korean because she could do this. So just as much as like my parents would fight uh, when I would do something that they didn't like about whose daughter I was, when I would do something that they were proud of, oh, that's my daughter. No, that's my daughter. (laughs) Now it becomes the other kind of fight, Mm -hmm. uh, which is hilarious. But yeah, my mom was very, I think, was coming from a very mixed place. And I'm grateful for that because it has definitely fueled my work and especially given me the perspective I have with the type of research that I do. Yeah, I was curious what drew you to the field of linguistics and then neurolinguistics specifically. So (laughs) I was always really good at science and math. Um, English was not my strong suit. And I think now reflecting back on my experiences, it could be because the type of English you do in school was not the English that I'm familiar with um, as an African-American person. Oh, for so, sure. uh, you know, it's, it's just one of those things where you become very uncomfortable in that space and trying to do well on their tests and their standards of how to do English. We're going to put that to the side. <laughs> but I found that I was really good at math and really good at science because math was a language I could understand. I could do really well, not to like fit the Asian stereotype, but that was just something that I, I enjoyed because I liked the puzzle. But then when I got to college, I realized that I did not like being in a lab. And so at the time I was a chemistry pre-pharmacy major. I thought I was going to become a pharmacist. I didn't want to be pipetting all day. Like there's nothing exciting about working with chemicals all day. Mm -hmm. I was just like, oh, I got to do something else. Now I had taken model UN when I was in high school. So I was like, well, I'll just do international affairs, take a couple Mm -hmm. foreign language classes. So I was studying a little bit of Japanese, a little bit of Mandarin, but for my own Korean selfish reasons, um, (laughs) I did, I was doing all of this and my undergraduate advisor, when I told her I wanted to switch from chemistry to international affairs, which meant switching also colleges within the university. Mm -hmm. She was like, well, I don't think it's a good idea for you to give up on science altogether. Why don't you think about linguistics? And I never heard about linguistics. That was just a foreign word to me. And she was like, yeah, you like science. You like language. I see you're doing well in these foreign language classes. Take an intro to linguistics course, see how you feel about it and go from there. So I was like, okay. So I took a linguistics course and instantly fell in love. It was everything that I liked about science, but I got to do that with and about people and understanding how people use language and understand the systematicity of language. Like I think sometimes people think when it's linguistics, like all we do is translate or interpret. And that's Mm -hmm. actually not what most linguists do. Mm -hmm. We usually focus on a very specific level of language and understanding how that system works. What are the 
things that make languages different, but also what are the things that make languages maybe potentially universal in some aspect. It's a way of thinking about how we are all underlyingly human. And that became such a cool thing for me. But it wasn't until I had finished my undergrad and I was working for a publisher that I realized that there were people who researched language in the brain, but didn't have linguistics training. They're coming over from a psychology training or a neuroscience training. All that to say, I it took me a long time to get to where I'm at now, but it all started when I was an undergrad and my undergrad advisor being like, hey, you like language, you like science, you should think about linguistics. And that's how I got to where I'm at now. That's super cool. I've always been fascinated by languages, like the origin of languages, how they come to be, the human process of it all. Uh, To the point I took Latin in high school where, you know, most people do not do that. They take Spanish or something, quote unquote, useful. But I just love breaking down words and breaking them apart. And so I always assumed most linguists are coming at it from that space. But I never even thought of coming at it from the scientific side. So I find that really fascinating. What has been your experience working in maybe linguistics more broadly, but specifically neurolinguistics as a biracial and bilingual person? Because I imagine that experience is different than a lot of your colleagues. Yeah. So it's funny. I think being a Black biracial bilingual person in general, when you're talking about academia, is a wild space to be in because For one, I really grew up bicultural Mm -hmm. um, as well as bilingual. And so I see how competing systems interact all the time. I grew up with that my entire life. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different thing to have that as a lived experience and think about what that means when you're doing research on bilingual processing. Because Mm -hmm. then the idea about thinking about how one brain can handle two competing language systems in a single brain, you know, if you didn't grow up with that experience, you're going to have a very different perspective on how Mm -hmm. you think that might work. And what's nice is that I've been able to find other people who don't have the same experience as me, but have enough of a similar experience where we can read each other, see how each other is thinking about a particular type of research. Now, in terms of my work specifically, so I think I mentioned before what I'm interested in is language in the brain. Mm -hmm. I'm specifically interested in the parts of the brain that support our ability to combine words in meaningful ways. So what are all the things that have to happen for you to take something like red and boat and put them together? That was, in essence, a lot of what my PhD advisor was working on and is still working on, just the combinatorics is what we like to call it, Mm -hmm. um, that allow us to do this kind of combination. Because it's not just a matter of hearing a word and then waiting for the next word, but you have to know how those two words combine versus two words that even if they come sequentially that don't combine Mm -hmm. and understanding how they combine. Because for example, red and boat gives you the interpretation that the boat is painted red. Right. But if I told you a meat boat, you're not going to think a boat that's made out of meat. You're going to think it's a boat that carries meat, Mm -hmm. right? So it's a different function but they appear in the same order. They come sequentially one after another. The only thing that's different is red versus meat. So how do we get to this different interpretation? But then what happens when you're a bilingual? Because we do this thing sometimes when we meet another bilingual and we're like, oh, I can just use all the words that I know and I can just combine them in all the ways that make sense. And we just get it. And it's very different from growing up as a literate, educated person in a single language because you've been trained to use that language in a particular way, you never get trained to code switch or be bilingual, Mm -hmm. right? It's something that naturally happens as a part of trying to communicate. And so I think that in its essence is the rawest way that we can really look at how language works in the brain and understand how the brain is able to do these kinds of operations. I think then (laughs) from there, the departure into what I'm doing now versus what I was doing during my PhD is is I'm thinking, okay, well, how did I get here? Because I didn't have the same linguistic experiences as people who grew up only learning Korean or only learning African-American English or only learning WASPy standardized mm-hmm. American English. You know what I mean? Despite having a very different kind of input such that I can maintain one language at a time if I need to or use all of my languages together when I need to. And that's something that's beautiful about the bilingual experience that we don't always get to think about or talk about. It's always this kind of, oh, how do I fit 
in this monolingual box versus this monolingual box or feeling incompetent because, well, I don't speak this one particular language as well as this other in this way. Mm -hmm. And that's been an interesting perspective that I can carry into how I analyze data and how I set up my research questions and and even just thinking through how do I actually test the question and hypotheses that I create based off of what people have done before with a very monolingual perspective. Mm -hmm. How do I now make this theory or develop a theory about how brain and language work that is more inclusive of all different types of linguistic experiences, especially my own, because I didn't see people who look like me, think like me, talk like me doing this research. I saw people who are coming from Europe where, you know, it's no big deal. Like they don't have the same kind of competition or conflict. At least I don't think they suffer from that same kind of conflict right. between their languages as I have with mine, mm -hmm. for example. And we're starting to see that in also in the bilingualism literature. We don't see that all bilinguals show some of these bilingual advantage effects that have been reported if you've read these kinds of articles in the New York Times or in other reputable news sources. I think being literally, I don't know of any other Blasian neurolinguists out there. If you find them, please send them my way because <laughs> I feel very lonely here sometimes. But in the interactions that I have with Black neuroscientists, with Asian neuroscientists, and then with the non non-Black, non-Asian neuroscientists, we all have very different experiences. And I think I offer a very different perspective in how it all works. And because of that, I can, I think, push the field in a more inclusive direction when we think about models and theories and the clinical implications thereof. That's really awesome. I wish there were more as well, because <laughs> it's so hard, because obviously, or maybe not obviously, a lot of my curiosity stems around my own experiences as a biracial person, as a Black person. And when you're interested in language, those things, like you were speaking to, come into conflict. There's not as much, if any, sometimes <laughs> research done in these spaces. So I would love to have a more wider diversity in academia in general, of course, but especially in linguistics and neurolinguistics, I think that'd be really cool. You were talking about the conflict that bilinguals face here. And I think it's really interesting that that does reflect different language outcomes like you were speaking to. And I do wonder, we have these articles that are talking about, oh, the benefits of being growing up bilingual, da, 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 da. I wonder though, should we work as a society in America to remove those conflicts? Or are those differences really negative differences or are they just differences? I'm going to say that they're just differences. There are always going to be points of conflict, but the way that we as people can find self-betterment, can strive to be better people is through conflict. Like you can't be a better person if at some point something didn't create tension or force you to go through some situation that made you feel uncomfortable that's just how we can become better people and become a more humane society is understanding that we're not all built the same. And because we're not all built the same, there is going to be natural conflict. Where I think the conflicts can be taxing or demanding is actually when it comes to making social decisions. Mm -hmm. It's the idea of when to use what particular language and how do you put your best face forward using your language, depending on who you're talking to, who's around, and what context you're in. All of that decision-making can be relatively exhausting. And that can fluctuate also depending on, you know, your own personality. Are you someone who thrives in these kinds of very extroverted type environments where you're around a lot of people and you get to socialize? Me, I'm naturally very introverted. So for me, it's just like all of it is very exhausting. So once it goes past more than talking to one person at a time, I'm just like slightly overwhelmed. And then it exponentially increases the more people are there, mm -hmm. especially when it's more people that I don't know. Know, and I have to try and navigate when to use what and how to say what. And, you know, if I can be so honest, there have been times where I was, you know, I had a little bit to drink and I just went with Korean because I was feeling and thinking in Korean at that moment. <laughs> I, I just gave up on trying to 
manage when to use what language. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times Black people, we talk about code switching being exhausting because we feel like we have to put on a facade or make white people in particular feel comfortable around us. And the exhaustion is not the code switching act itself. It's not the suppressing of the language that you don't want to use. The exhaustion is having to feel like you have to manage your communication for the sake of this other person, Mm -hmm. because that other person is a social cost or social burden on your own, you know, desires, wishes, whatever intentions, however that interaction is supposed to go. So I don't have evidence to speak to that specifically, but the evidence that I do see when it comes to costs of switching languages doesn't come from the linguistic system. It absolutely comes from things like attention and working memory, things that we use cognitively speaking in all other facets. It's not language specific. And they do show up in when we do make these kinds of social cognitive decisions. So, you know, I'm more willing to believe that the burden is on the social aspects of languaging Mm -hmm. versus the actual linguistic aspects of languaging. It's actually really interesting. I've never thought of it this way, but you're talking about how it's the social burden that makes it very difficult to code switch. And again, I'm not going to claim that this is equal or necessarily the exact same as being fully bilingual. But I think about, you know, me and my friends who are Black talking about code switching and how code switching is very demanding. However, if I think about it, when we're talking amongst ourselves, we are definitely constantly using both whatever you want to call it, general American English and African American English. But nobody's feeling burdened by switching back and forth because there's no social requirement to do so. There's no pressure there. We're just doing it because we're fluent, quote unquote, if you will, in both. And so both just come out equally. I imagine that's similar to the experience you were talking about earlier, being bilingual and meeting another bilingual person just saying, oh, great, I can just let whatever fly. Exactly. And and honestly, what evidence we do have of cost of switching and how that might be social only comes from the fact that these effects occur when you are forced to switch because of a particular cue mm-hmm. or you're forced to suppress one language in a particular scenario. That's where we see robust effects. And again, these effects appear very much in regions that are associated with more general cognitive tasks like attention and working memory, conflict resolution type tasks than the linguistic-y type tasks, the language parts of the brain that are more typically associated with specific language functions like combining words, processing speech, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for Black language learners specifically? It could be from the linguistic (laughs) point of view or just your experience as a bilingual person watching people try to learn your language. I think the advice I can give is don't be discouraged and find your tribe. So for the first part, don't be discouraged. I think this is true of any language learner. There are going to be times where you feel like you've hit a rut. There are going to be times (laughs) where you feel like the words just won't come out. And that's, you know, right now. Okay. (laughs) You know, that's, I mean, if you think about it, when you are learning a language, you're learning a new way of forming your mouth to make sounds you've never had to make before. Mm -hmm. And if you don't intuitively still have this sense of being able to pick up what those sounds are, and you're trying to match something that you don't hear as well, because you weren't attuned to hearing for this distinction. And this is something that does happen with language learning. We, over time, once we learn our language, it becomes harder to then listen for things that we weren't attuned to listen for as an adult. That's Mm -hmm. what makes language learning in a second language a bit harder. It's not impossible, but it does make it a little harder. And so you're breaking old habits, old brain habits to form new ones, to be more accepting of not only the language that you already know, but of this new language that you're trying to learn. And so with that, it can sometimes be very discouraging, but don't be discouraged. It's just something that over time, the more you do it, the more comfortable you get. And the ultimate goal is just to be able to be conversant, right? You just want to be able to interact with this language and be able to better understand it than you did before. So with that, the second part, find your tribe, is really important because you want to be in an environment and find a community of people where you feel safe to make mistakes, where you feel like you're going to get the kind of support you need to not only learn the language, but also learn the culture, learn the history, learn things about 
not only the language, but the people who speak that language. Because when you learn a language, you shouldn't learn a language like you learn math to do some self-sufficient skill. You're learning language to be social and to be a part of the human experience and look at it from a different lens or experience it through a different perspective. And so with that comes actually finding people you want to hang out with. Like, why learn a language when you don't want to hang out with the people who also speak that language? Like, no person who's learning Korean right now doesn't want to secretly meet whatever, (laughs) you know, bias they have and be able to tell them in their language, oh my God, I love you. Will you marry me tomorrow? Like, who does it? It's a call out. It's not true though. (laughs) So go into that with that in mind and find your tribe. Find some friends who have biases of the same group, but not the same one because you don't want to compete for the same person. (laughs) And, you know, have an opportunity where you can interact with each other, use language together. And in a way it continues to build what language is intended to do, which is to allow us to be social. So yeah, don't be discouraged and find your tribe. I will second that from my just personal anecdotal experience, which is not the same as a well-studied doctor of neurolinguistics. However, that was the mistake I made learning Korean was that Because my interests are naturally, oh, I'm so fascinated by language, I dove into the grammar, but learned it very similar to your learning math. You're like going into the books and you're researching and you're trying to understand how this language works, which is fun. If that's what you want to do, it is fun. I found it very fun anyway. But it means I'm a whole lot less conversational considering how long I've studied and how much grammar I know. So I would second that. You're in it to be social. So if you can, the quicker you can move into the social aspect, I would say the better. And that's, I think, common advice. I just ignored it. So that's on me. But Well, we all want to ignore it because that's actually the hard part. The hard part is being like, okay, I'm going to sound stupid. True. Which yes. honestly, no one wants to sound stupid. And I think I put out a TikTok video, which was very much me ranting about how I think it's really stupid that we have this tightly woven connection between your language abilities and how smart someone is. Because so tr- there is a loose connection, but they're not so interdependent that you can make a judgment off of one from the other and vice versa, right? And so the sooner one can like let go of that ego and just be willing to, listen and be open and be willing to just make mistakes, stutter, do all those things over time, those things will happen less and less frequently. And that's because the more you do it, the more you engage in it. We see like, this is why people always talk about immersion because what you need is greater opportunity opportunities for both input and output for your language skill to continue to update and improve. That's how the learning mechanism is modeled to work. Now, research is still trying to figure out how those mechanisms work exactly, which is why you haven't heard a good answer from some of us about how do we best and most efficiently learn a language. But what we do know is the amount and the quality of one's input as well as output matters in creating that opportunity, especially for the fact that when you practice producing, you're also hearing it back to yourself. It's a way of getting additional input because you've now said it out loud. And it forms a feedback loop because as you then hear yourself saying it as you're seeing how people, when you get the eyes of like, oh, I understand, or oh, I don't understand, you're now able to then make corrections and fix as you continue to practice and do that sort of thing. So all the more reason to keep practicing. And if you're in an environment where people understand where you're coming from and they're not going to think that you're stupid because you're learning, that creates a safe space for you. I guess my last question then is, what hopes do you have for the future of the study of linguistics and or the language learning space for Black folks specifically? Honestly, I want more Black people in linguistics. I think the hard truth about linguistics is like, we don't have a good PR team to say like, (laughs) you should study linguistics. Here's what linguistics can offer you. You know, it's not the same thing as psychology or business because people don't see a career path, quote unquote, through linguistics in the same way. But I think that's also the beauty of linguistics is that you have the opportunity to create the kind of career you want because at the end of the day, any career you choose, any path you walk, language is going to be involved in it. You can't Mm -hmm. exist in this world as a human 
and be functioning in society without language. It just doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And this is why we tell people if your child is born deaf or your child is born blind, it doesn't mean you don't introduce language to them. You just find a modality that works for them and then you use language with them because that's how they will still be able to have that kind of human experience that we all actually, I think, internally want and need. So as Black people, I think sometimes we see gatekeeping and we think, oh, it's going to be so hard. It's going to be this uphill battle. I don't want to be a part of something where it's going to be an uphill battle. And I don't know what my career outcome could be with it. Mm -hmm. And that's the unfortunate part, because I think sometimes we need also as Black people a little bit of grace to just figure things out and not have to feel like we need to strive towards some version of ourselves that is considered acceptable either in the white gaze or in the black gaze, Mm -hmm. because those gazes are both of them (laughs) come with pressure in my mind. Um, So yeah, I think for me, I would love to see more black linguists. And in particular, I want to see more black linguists go into the various different subfields. So a lot of black linguists typically stay within sociolinguistics, which is great, which Mm -hmm. is studying how languages are used among communities and where we see a lot of variation and change with language that happens from language existing in communities. Mm -hmm. And that work is important, but that work is only as good as our ability to then say, okay, what does that then mean for the brain and people doing the cognitive neuroscience aspect of that, or people going into the more theoretical subfields and saying, no, like if Black English is as legitimate as any other language, then why don't we use this language to test some of these theories or models within, let's say, phonology, which is about structuring speech sounds, or syntax, which is about how words are structured into sentences. We need people to be in those spaces too. And we need Black linguists in computational linguistics. So if you really want to worry about job situation, job security, and you're like, I'll do whatever pays money, become a computational linguist. Because if I hear another tech company coming through with this job offer, like we need somebody who can help us get AI human interfacing technology to work. So getting Siri to work, getting Alexa to work. And best believe Siri and Alexa does not like black Sarah voice. I got to put on, you know, waspy Mm -hmm. Sarah voice for Siri to work. Well, we need more black linguists who can do that work and make sure our technology is also inclusive of us too. And that actually requires linguists. Another thing, speech language pathologists. Here's another career field that we desperately need black people in and a linguistics training will help you get there because I'm collaborating with a black speech language pathologist who also is now a neuroscientist. She got her PhD because there was not enough research on speech language pathology concerning black people. And she was like, well, I guess let me go do this PhD so I can do that research because we need that so desperately. Mm -hmm. And there's always a demand for speech language pathologists, whether it's working with children, but in particular, working with adults, in particular, given the fact that stroke and heart attack is so prevalent in black and brown communities, like stroke disproportionately affects black people. And so from that, there's now a greater proportion or probability of black people who suffer from stroke developing chronic aphasia. And yet we don't have enough SLPs, let alone black SLPs to support these people Mm -hmm. and helping them regain some quality of life should they survive a stroke, which is basically where part of your brain could not get oxygen that it needed to function. And that's very scary. So I think if we can get more Black people in linguistics and go into these different fields and introduce other people, despite what gatekeeping they see, to what that means and be willing to do that work because it is exhausting. It is very much an uphill battle still. It is worth it because it can have very direct consequences for us as people in general, not just Black people, but for people in general. And we need that. We so desperately need that. Your words make me feel hopeful that this future can exist because it sounds so needed. And that you can, even if you don't know anything about linguistics, like I'm sure a lot of listeners at home, you see these effects in day-to-day life, right? Linguistics sounds like this far off, like, oh, that seems like real dense academic 
whatever people may think, but this affects your day-to-day life talking about the speech pathologist. And I didn't even know about computational <laughs> linguistics. That's wild. And it's not something I would have thought about exactly, except that I know if I'm using voice to whatever, Siri, Alexa, those types of programs, I know that I have to speak in a very certain way in order to make sure it understands what I'm asking. And how did I learn that? Why is that the case? Like these are, that is so fascinating. I too hope <laughs> that more people become interested in the field and just check it out. If you're listening, I implore you, just check it out. See if it's for you. I mean, like Sarah said, you were a math and science person. You didn't know that this field was going to be open to you. And yet here you are. <laughs> now I have a whole doctor in it. It's wild. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought, right? Again, this is just a nerdy interest of mine. I'm so fascinated by it. I learned so much just in this talk alone. So if y'all have questions for Sarah or just questions about linguistics in general, please let us know because I will definitely pass them on to Sarah. And if we get enough, yeah, maybe we'll have to do a part two. But until then, thank you so much, Sarah, for coming on. Tell the good folks where they can find you. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, even though that might become a dumpster fire if it's not already (laughs) one, and TikTok, all three social media platforms as Sarah Linguist. So that's S-A-R-A-H-L-I-N-G-U-I-S-T. You can find me on social media. I try to be consistent about content, but I also keep my social media accessible. So if you send me a message or DM, as long as it's appropriate, I don't mind responding and being as helpful as I can. Well, great. Thank you again for joining me. And thank you all so much for listening. I'm curious if y'all have questions or if you're learning any languages, have you wanted to learn a language but couldn't for one reason or the other, you can let me know at Culture X Podcast on Twitter or IG. And you can join us next week where we will be joined by Sheila the Band. And until then, keep it chill and keep it nerdy. Thank you.